This is a Commitment 2022 special in partnership with the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. The Granite State Debates. With polls showing most Granite State voters consider the country to be on the wrong track, a wide range of Republicans are competing to challenge the incumbent in New Hampshire's first congressional district. They're offering choices between youth and experience, fighting strategies, and a more traditional approach. If you don't have the guts as a candidate, let's face it, you don't become more authentic, more conservative once you get down there. Tim Baxter serves as a state representative for Seabrook and Hampton Falls. The youngest candidate in the race, he's a member of New Hampshire's Freedom Caucus and founded and runs a business restoring rental properties around New Hampshire. Gail Huff Brown spent decades working as a journalist. Under President Trump, her husband served as ambassador to New Zealand and Samoa, where Huff Brown, now a grandmother, was elected president of the Diplomatic Spouses Association. I know what it looks like to live in a country that is socialist. I know what that looks like now. I don't want that for America. Caroline Levitt's experience includes time as an assistant press secretary for President Trump and communications director for New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. She says it's critical to teach younger generations about conservative values. Now more than ever, we need young people right in Washington on both sides of the aisle, OK, to shake up the system. The folks are just truly fed up out there with what they're seeing in Washington, D.C. They're tired of the same old, same old. They're tired of folks like Chris Pappas. Matt Mowers is looking for a rematch of his 2020 race with Chris Pappas, this time pointing to the Democrats' record of the last two years as reason to vote for a Republican. Mauer's background also includes time in the Trump administration as a senior White House advisor at the State Department. Russell Prescott is a former executive counselor and state senator who says his long record of public service is the best preparation for representing New Hampshire. There's dysfunction in Washington, but I will not be part of it. I will get down there and I will work as I have worked. Prescott runs a family business making and distributing water treatment systems. Varying types of political experience combined with a variety of backgrounds. Which one will voters choose to speak for them in Washington? Tonight, the Republican candidates for the 1st Congressional District. Good evening and thank you for joining us for the Granite State Debates. I'm WMUR Political Director Adam Sexton. Tonight we'll be hearing from the Republican candidates for the 1st Congressional District. Five of those candidates are joining us tonight. They'll be answering questions from me and from our panelists. Those panelists tonight are WMUR anchors Steve Botari and Gene Mackin. Here's a look at our format tonight. Each candidate will get up to 60 seconds to answer their questions. They'll get up to 30 seconds for a rebuttal if necessary. That will be at my discretion. Candidates will also be given 60 seconds at the close of the hour for closing statements. We also want to note some changes to the makeup of New Hampshire's congressional districts this year. The regular redistricting process moved five towns from the first to the second district. So people in Albany, Campton, Jackson, New Hampton, and Sandwich are now in the second congressional district. We want to jump right into the questions for all the candidates tonight, and we're going to start with Steve Batari. Adam, thank you. If elected, you will take office in the coldest month of the year. The cost of energy is currently through the roof. Quick look at where prices stand tonight. Natural gas is up 23% over last year. Heating oil up 76%. And electricity has increased by 126%. We know you're all critical of President Biden and Democrats, but specifically, looking forward, what is your plan to bring down energy costs to directly benefit consumers? Mr. Mowers, we begin with you. Well, Steve, thank you so much. And uh, it's great to be with everyone tonight. You know, I, I was sitting on the couch this last February with my wife and we saw a notice pop up that there was a GoFundMe page for a couple with six kids up by us who couldn't afford their home heating oil for two weeks. So they all huddled around the living room uh, for two whole weeks plugging in space heaters. We're going to hear countless stories like that as we go through the next winter. And the problem is this is all driven by Chris Pappas and Joe Biden's policies. It just came out today that Joe Biden has actually provided fewer leases than any president since World War II. These are the policies which are driving the cost of gas right now. We need an all of the above approach. We need more oil and drilling. We need more nuclear. We need to make sure that we're having additional alternatives as well. And we need to make it here in the United States. That's the problem. Right now, too much of this is being produced in China or being produced in the Mideast. We can't have a leadership like we've seen right now with Joe Biden and Chris Pappas who are going around and groveling to people like in Iran or thugs in Venezuela. We need to make it here in the United States. And that's what I'm committed to. 
And I'm the only one who worked with President Trump when I served as senior White House advisor in his State Department to actually approve the Keystone XL pipeline. We knew it was important for the uh, producing energy here in the United States, as well as to ensure that it was open for business here in America. That's what we're going to get back to. Representative Baxter, to you next. Same question. Well, we need to restore American energy independence. And Joe Biden's energy strategy is to go begging to the Saudis for oil. Instead, we should build the Keystone Pipeline. We should allow drilling on federal lands. And we need to expand nuclear energy. I'm a state representative from Seabrook, New Hampshire, born and raised there. And we need more nuclear power plants here in New Hampshire. And look at what the Democrats and what Chris Pappas are doing right now. They just passed a $700 billion Green New Deal boondoggle. And they want to pay for that by expanding the IRS, which would harass our businesses, it would harass conservatives here in New Hampshire. This is the wrong approach. We should be expanding American energy independence. And instead of um, expanding the IRS, especially when we see how political and how these agencies are being weaponized against conservatives like President Donald Trump, instead of expanding the IRS, we should abolish the IRS. Ms. Levitt, what specifically would you do to bring down energy costs to directly benefit consumers? Well, this certainly is one of the number one priorities of constituents across New Hampshire's first district, whom I've spoken with every single day over the past year. This administration launched a war on our domestic energy production in day one. Joe Biden canceled the Keystone X pipeline. I was proud to work in President Trump's White House when we hosted a press conference announcing that we were for the first time in our nation's history a net exporter of oil. And we did that by tapping into the resources that God blessed us with here in the United States of America. We need to reverse the policies of the Biden administration and relaunch our American energy independence. And when we take back the House in January, we have to be very mindful as Republicans about calling out the Democrats for why they've waged this war. They want complete and total control over every aspect of our lives, including socializing the energy industry. They want to control what we drive, how far we can go, how much gas we can put in our oil tanks and in our cars. We have to call them out for their blatant socialism and relaunch our domestic energy production. Councillor Prescott, what is your plan to bring down energy costs? All of the above as well. Make sure that we do open up the Keystone Pipeline and get back to the policies that we had two years ago, two years ago when we were energy independent. I also want to mention that my experience in the State Senate, being the chairman of the Energy Committee, is, is good for this situation. I know how to run committees. I know how to, to uh, get legislation passed. And that's a, a really, really big part about being a congressperson, is to have the experience to be able to go down there on day one to make good, sound judgment. People are asking for sound judgment, and that's what I have provided for 10 years in the state Senate. So if we go back to being energy, energy independent, that would be the first way that we stop inflation. We have the price of gas and oil going up, and inflation is going up. That's one way of stopping inflation, therefore making things more affordable, not just energy itself, but also the way we live, our way of life. The second thing that does that is a balanced budget. And that's what I will go down to Washington to have done. That will lower inflation as well. That's what I've done in the state of New Hampshire in the state Senate for five terms straight. Thank you. And Ms. Huff Brown, specifically with uh, energy costs, what is your plan? Well, I have called again and again and again to suspend the gas tax, both federally and statewide. And I call for that once again. Just last week, I met with uh, Mickey over at Ryan's and she said their electric bill last month was $500 more than the month before. That worries me. It worries me for small businesses. It worries me for people that are trying to pay their bills. My mother lives on Social Security. I worry about how is she going to pay her heating bills. There is no question that we have to stop Joe Biden and his administration. The only way we do that in 2022 is by shifting the House and shifting the Senate. And that's why I'm running, because we have to stop this administration. Energy costs out of control, inflation out of control. Yes, we are not energy independent, and we need to be. 
This is a huge problem for America. And we're seeing the impact it's having all over the world. Look at what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. A lot of that based upon oil, gas, and energy. Yes, we do have to get back to an all of the above approach. No question about it. Next question comes from Jean Mackin. Thanks, Adam. On Tuesday, July 12th, nine warning signs, sirens, accidentally sounded within a 10 mile radius of the Seabrook nuclear power station, alarming people in the area, including visitors to Hampton Beach. State and local emergency officials say it took about an hour to confirm it was a false alarm caused by human error. Ms. Huff Brown, you were in the area campaigning at the time. Should Congress take a more active role in investigating this and protecting Granite Staters in the future? I said before, and I'm going to say it again, I was there that day. I was knocking doors in the neighborhood, and I heard the first alarm go off, and I heard the call, get off the beach. I honored that call. I immediately vacated the beach along with my campaign manager. We drove away from there. I then called the local police. I called the sheriff's department. Frankly, I even called a newsroom to let them know what was happening. I also wanted to find out if they had any idea what was happening. So I will always look to the cause and find out for Granite Staters what's going on. Does Congress have a role in that? You know what I'm happy about? I'm happy that it worked. I'm happy the alarm went off and I knew that there might be a problem because I immediately evacuated that area. That's what that alarm is supposed to do. It's supposed to alarm people that there could be an emergency. Were people inconvenienced? Absolutely. But what would be worse? What would be worse is if people were sitting on the beach and God forbid there was an actual emergency. I'm glad the system worked. Representative Baxter, part of the area is in your district at the State House. What do you think? Well, I agree with Gail that it did work. The alarm system worked. And we have to be honest with people and talk about the facts. Nuclear power is safe and effective all throughout the country. We should be expanding nuclear energy. And in part, it's not because people on the left have this negative view about nuclear power. But think about what they're saying. The left, you see people like AOC, they're saying the world's going to end in 12 years. But nuclear power has no CO2 emissions. So if you really believe that, you would want to expand nuclear energy right away. So this is an industry that will help reduce the cost of energy, help give people relief here in New Hampshire that are struggling. And it's also safe and effective. So I'm, I'm a big supporter of nuclear energy, and this is something that I will fight for in Congress. Councillor Prescott, your thoughts? Certainly. You know, I have deep roots here in the seacoast. Uh, you could say that, uh, well, I guess by legislation, I am a native. I'm a New Hampshire native. Even though my mom and dad were down in Florida when I was born, they were wintering there. I lived at uh, 50 Hampton Road in Exeter. And when the nuclear power plant was being decided to be built, and I know there was a lot of discussion about it then, and it was, it was very, very highly contentious. But we've had that nuclear power plant here in Seabrook for how many years now? Probably 40 years. And this is the first time that I've heard of such a thing happening where the alarm actually went off. And to think about that in terms of all the contention over nuclear power back in the 80s, now to where we are today, talking about one instance where an alarm went off, I think nuclear power is a future use of a future way of making energy and I think that's important. I will not be fighting against nuclear energy as a congressman. I would be fighting for it. Ms. Levitt. Well, the Seabrook nuclear power plan absolutely provides safe, clean and efficient energy for our state and the surrounding areas and it also provides hundreds of good paying jobs for hardworking people many of whom i've had the pleasure of meeting over the past year and when i'm in congress it will never be my goal to expand the size the scope and the role of the federal government and how we do business here in new hampshire so more congressional oversight more congressional bureaucracy on the seabrook power plant or on any of our institutions in our state absolutely not but this does go back to the war on our domestic energy in its entirety, right? Both on nuclear and on fossil fuels. And the scariest thing about that war is it is winning with my generation of voters. Young people in America are eating up the Democrats' messaging on this issue. They truly believe that the world is going to end in 10 years if we don't address the issue of climate change. That's absolutely not true. And as a young American, I will speak truth on that issue and ensure them that nuclear and fossil fuels are the way to go.
and Mr. Mowers. I'm a little biased because uh, my dad actually was a diver on the construction of the Seabrook power plant back in the day. Uh, it's actually the job that brought our family to New Hampshire uh, when I was pretty young. And uh, one of the things that I learned from that was really the good paying jobs that are created when we do have good American energy products. We need to do more of that. By the way, my wife's aunt also was there. She happened to get arrested for protesting the Seabrook power plant during its construction as well. Um, so there, it was controversial. But we can get through that, and we now know that this is a safe, effective, and reliable form of energy. In fact, there's new types of nuclear right now, which are more reliable, cheaper, and smaller, and less intrusive than any time in, in history before. China right now, believe it or not, is putting up small nuclear reactors all the time. France is powering over 70% of their grid from nuclear. We can do it in a safe and reliable way, but we have to ensure that we have federal representatives who are looking to actually ensure that we have that safe, reliable nuclear so that it can get done. And then, of course, we do have oversight when it's necessary, and we have to look into situations like this. All right, next question coming from Steve Botori. Adam, thanks. A UNH poll out just last week says housing is now a top issue for a growing number of Granite Staters. Some of the numbers that stand out from this, a June report shows 20,000 more housing units would be needed to get close to having a healthy market for this state for housing. The median sales price of a single family home in New Hampshire is now $450,000. Rent for a two bedroom is almost $1,600 a month. Is there a role for the federal government to help with this? And if sent to Washington, what specifically would you do to alleviate this problem? Councillor Prescott to you first. Thank you very much. When I get to Washington, if I get there, I pray to, I, that I do, it's talking about the budget. It's talking about balancing the budget. How often have we sent congressmen and senators down to Washington, D.C. and not balanced the budget? If we balance the budget, turn deficits into surpluses, and take care of the greatest needs in our country, that's the way it's done. We can focus right on housing. We can focus on giving a very strong economy so everyone's life style or life um, income is increased and therefore everything is more affordable. If we stop inflation, everything is more affordable. That all stems from balancing our budget. How many times, again, have we sent people down there to not get that done? It's what I have been talking about since 1998 when I first ran for office. That's 24 years of running for office. That's real experience. That's growing up in politics in New Hampshire. My stripes won't change, I've said, Let's balance the budget. And I did it for 10 years straight. And that's what I will do in Washington, D.C. Ms. Levitt. Yes. Well, the housing crisis is certainly something that's unique to our state here in New Hampshire. And I believe it's for a number of factors. First and foremost, obviously, the rising cost of rent burdensome regulations and reducing red tape. That's what I'll focus on when I get to Congress, reducing those restrictions for investors to come to our state and develop housing. We have a big population of young folks here that attend our higher educational university system, but they leave because they can go rent an apartment down in South Boston and get a better, better paying job than they can here in the state of New Hampshire. And the housing crisis is then leading to a massive labor crisis. Every single business owner that I've spoken with over the last year, and I'm proud to be supported by so many of them in this campaign, has a major labor crisis. They cannot hire enough workers to do these jobs, so addressing the housing crisis will then lead to that and stopping the spending in Washington, D.C., paying people more to stay home than to get back to work. We have to get our unmitigated spending in Washington under control as well. Representative Baxter, to you next. Well, I actually run a real estate business, so this is an issue I'm very familiar with. And it's not just in New Hampshire, it's all across the country. People are struggling with the dramatically increasing cost of housing. And if you look at the CPI, it's actually one of the, the biggest parts that's increasing. One thing we can do here in New Hampshire is a land court to make sure that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, developers and that zoning laws are properly being followed here in New Hampshire. The other thing we have to do is balance the budget. Because the politicians are spending and printing money like drunken sailors, that's causing not just housing, but the cost of everything to go up. I serve on the Ways and Means Committee here in New Hampshire. I helped pass our budget, which was the only budget in the whole country that cut spending. What we need is those live free or die conservative values in Washington and someone with the guts to fight for those values. I already am a proven conservative fighter and I will fight for those values in Washington. 
Mr. Mowers, changing this up a bit, should federal policy emphasize helping people achieve the dream of home ownership or help them afford rent? I mean, look, the cornerstone of the American dream is home ownership. You know, my wife and I, as much as we shake our head every month when we write that check to the bank for our mortgage, also have an incredible sense of pride. Unfortunately, that American dream is slipping away for so many right now. And it's directly because of Joe Biden and Chris Pappas' policies. I mean, part of the reason we have a housing shortage is that there's supply chain challenges for building new homes. Talk to anyone who's in construction, and they'll tell you that they cannot get the goods that they need in a timely manner and an affordable price to actually build affordable homes for young families. We can get, if we get tackled the challenge of inflation, and we actually get serious about the supply chain problems that have been caused by Joe Biden and Chris Pappas' policies, we can address this thing. The other thing we can do is ensure that we have local control. We don't need the federal government telling towns and communities how they should be uh, setting up their town with more apartments and things like that. That's for local and state office holders to be making those decisions. So it's in the character of the community. And Ms. Hep Brown, same question. What should federal policy target? I do agree that this is a state and local issue. One of the problems that we have are towns that have districting that doesn't allow for multifamily housing, affordable housing, and different forms of housing. I too am a realtor, so obviously I know this topic very well. Over the past couple of years, we've seen the prices on the seacoast where I live go up incredibly, more than anywhere else in the state. And we have to look ahead. Now, what's going to happen? Obviously, part of the housing crisis is the labor crisis, and they go hand in hand. And we need to incentivize companies to keep our labor force here. My daughter works here in Portsmouth, and my granddaughter was born here in Portsmouth. I want them to stay here forever. And the only way we keep young people here and we keep them employed is by making sure that they can afford housing. It is so, so vital. So that is something that I will work very, very hard. It's a federal, state, and local issue. Next question from Jean Mackin. Since the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade, states across the country have been enacting restrictions on and protections for abortions. Many on the stage have said that this is now a state issue. But if Republicans gain majority in the U.S. House in November, a vote on abortion restrictions could come to the floor. Constituents expect to know where candidates stand. So what restrictions on abortion, if any, would you vote for on the federal level? We'll begin with you, Ms. Levitt. Well, I am proudly pro-life, and I'm one of the few candidates in this race to publicly applaud the overturning of Roe v. Wade, because what it did is it returned this right, this issue, back to we the people here in our great state of New Hampshire. Now, in our recent budget, as everyone at home watching knows, we passed a 24-week ban on abortion. Personally, I'd like to see that taken a step farther, but I believe in the Constitution, and I believe in the Supreme Court's decision, and I hope that we will elect pro-life legislatures to the State House in Concord to make those decisions for the people here. Mr. Mowers. Well, I am pro-life. I'm reminded every single morning when I look into my son's eyes, my one-year-old's eyes, about the value of life. You know, I'm proud to have worked with President Trump to ensure that we don't have U.S. tax dollars going to fund abortions overseas. We encourage the culture of life. In fact, I remember one specific time when I was traveling to a medical clinic just outside of Johannesburg, South Africa, and a woman with a baby on her hip was talking to her doctor. The doctor looked at her and said, your baby is going to be alive. You see him, he's American. Because of him, your baby's going to live. It's moments like that that remind me of why we cherish life in this world and why we need to cherish life in this country. Now, the Supreme Court has spoken and seemingly has said that these are all state-based issues for the most part. But as a pro-life legislator, I'll review every piece of legislation to ensure that we're encouraging that culture of life and make sure that we're doing things that are also in the best interest of grand staters. Representative Baxter, same question to you. What restrictions on abortion, if any, would you vote for on the federal level? Well, my brother Taylor has special needs, and he had a fetal anomaly. And when he was a baby in so many countries, babies like my brother Taylor, they're just aborted en masse, and it's horrifying. And so I'll never apologize for being pro-life. I believe life begins at conception. And... You, know, you just heard the other two candidates, they're talking about the New Hampshire law. None of us on this stage are running for a New Hampshire office. And talking about legislators in New Hampshire, it's just passing the buck. What are you going to do in Congress to fight for life? And I'm the only person on this stage that's pledged specific action to fight for life in Congress. 
This is important for the viewers to know. I will stand up and fight for life in Congress. It's the right thing to do. I won't do what's politically convenient. I'll do what's right. And seeing babies being murdered in the womb is wrong. And that's why I will fight for life in Congress. Ms. Huff Brown. Well, I'm the only one here who's given birth. Um, and uh, I shared a very personal story uh, with people because I want them to know exactly where I stand. I went into labor with my daughter at 20 weeks. And when I got to the emergency room in the hospital, the doctor said to me, your life or your baby's life, which do we save? I chose life. I will always choose life. But the government didn't make that decision for me. I made that choice. I made that choice. And I will tell you, the voters of New Hampshire will always know where I stand on everything. I'm not afraid of any subject. I'm not afraid of any topic. I will go head on into anyone, and they will know exactly where I stand. They may not agree with me, and that's fine. But uh, the bottom line is that I support the New Hampshire law. I do not believe in third trimester abortion. I will not support federal funding for abortion. I will not support foreign aid being used for abortion. And Councillor Prescott. Thank you very much. I want to just say that Kurt Welper just recently is a representative of the state of New Hampshire's House, and he just endorsed me. He's very pro-life. I am pro-life. I'm bringing together that, that coalition. Also, just what happened today, Ruth Griffin, a longtime uh, executive counselor for 20 years, had her son, Michael, drive her from Portsmouth today all the way to my house to get a sign and say, Russell Prescott, you have my support 100 percent because you can win in November. And that is a coalition, not just pro-life, but others as well. I am pro-life. I agree with the state's rights. I have them continue to do what they're doing. But I also want to point out that this election is going to take place in November. For the best person to win against Chris Pappas, it's me. For five elections straight, I ran positive campaigns, no negative campaigning. And I made sure that I won five times in a row and did not have the problems of negative campaigning to dog me on my way out. That's time. So let's get more specific here because all of you want to go to Congress and that's essentially where you'd be taking votes as Representative Baxter pointed out. Three times in the last nine years, Republican controlled Congresses have passed the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act known as MICA's law, which is a federal abortion ban at the 20 week level of gestation. This is very likely, of course, to come back before the Congress again if Republicans take power in November. So by a show of hands, who would vote yes on MICA's law in Congress? I'm not sure I understand completely. That's a 20 week abortion ban that Republican Congresses have passed three times since 2013. Adam, I think it's important to add context, and if you don't mind, for an important reason, because we need to see what's going to pass constitutional muster as well. And so with the Supreme Court. This has passed Congress three times, and we know that legislation sure. often comes back. So the Congress has sure. agreed that it backs this but, already. But it's important to balance that out also with constitutional Do muster. Do you support it, yes or no? Well, if, if it passes the, the, constitutional muster, The Supreme muster, Court has it. said that the people, yeah. through their representatives, can choose. So Adam, you'll be the representative. Adam, I know the press likes to make these the things The lobbyist yes no is questions. giving his spin now. No, Just no, answer no, no, the no. question. Look, look, I know the Are press likes to make yes or no, no questions. But what's important is actually looking at this on the merits of the law. And if it's going to pass constitutional muster, as someone who's pro-life, I'm going to look at it and consider it. If it's not going to pass constitutional okay. muster, though, because that's time. So for the record, you're not, going to, well. you're not going to take a position. The only one on the stage who raised their hand was Representative Baxter. Okay. Yeah, and let me, let me add something for a sec. Everyone's talking about the New Hampshire law and different things that they say. Caroline ran around for 12 months saying she's 100% pro-life, and on a dime she flipped. She's not going to vote pro-life in Congress. Gail has said she was pro-choice and pro-life. Russell voted for Planned Parenthood money, and then Matt's trying to give his lobbyist speak and spin the question. I'm pro-life. We need people that aren't going to give political answers on this, that will fight back. This is not the issue to politicize. Okay, you've all been yeah, invoked, so we'll start, 30 seconds with, we'll start with 30 seconds with Caroline. I gave a personal yes. one. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I am pro-life, Tim, and I have been very vocal about that, and I also have been vocal about the fact that I agree with the Supreme Court's decision in this case. I'm also the only candidate in this race that has been publicly calling out Chris Pappas and the Democrats for their egregious lies on this issue. They are saying that every woman in this state is going to have our health and our safety and our rights threatened because of the Supreme Court's decision. That's absolutely 
absolutely not true. This ensures we have a greater voice at the state and local level. I will always champion life. I've had the privilege of it's touring time. pregnancy centers in this district, and we need to ensure a culture of life for young women across the state who feel threatened by the Democrats' disgusting messaging. Gail, 30 seconds. No, I would just like to say that I've been very clear about my feelings, very, very clear about my feelings and where I stand. I have never said I'm pro-life or pro-choice because you know what those are? Those are terms that politicians put out in front of everyone along with the media to divide. I'm not going to be divided on that. My uterus is not for sale. Never was, never will be. Council Prescott. Thank you. Uh, Planned Parenthood was mentioned. I've, I've already uh, have a record. I'm only one here having a record of fighting for pro-life issues. And you can see it in my New Hampshire State Senate record. I'll also answer any question about that to any questionnaires. I'm the only person that has answered questionnaires. The point is that, I forgot my train of thought. Uh, the, the point is that uh, we need to stop being divisive in this stage and in this arena. Negative campaigning is not what's going to draw us together and win against Chris Pappas. That's my vision. That's what I've done for 10 years straight, five years in being elected right, Council, by it. independence. That's time. Steve, next question. Thank you, Adam. A UNH poll from this June says the overwhelming majority of Granite Staters are confident that their vote in the 2020 election was accurately counted. The New Hampshire Secretary of State, a Republican, said the election was secure and the results valid. Do you have confidence in the Secretary of State and the hundreds of citizen volunteers who will run the election next week? Mr. Mowers, to you first. I have confidence in our New Hampshire elections. We always have to get better, right? I mean, we've seen some challenges around what happened in Wyndham. I'm glad that the Attorney General is now ensuring that there are election monitors in Wyndham. We have to ensure we're continuing to get better. That's why I'm glad that there is a bill that was passed that provide for routine audits, as well as making sure that we have voter ID here in New Hampshire. This is common sense stuff to ensure that folks have confidence in their elections. It's the bedrock of our constitutional republic. And we need to make sure that everyone knows that when their ballot goes in that box, that it counts. Until that number is 100%, we still have work to do. Ms. Huff Brown. Uh, well, I do have confidence. I have a great deal of confidence. I don't have confidence in Matt Mowers because he voted twice. He voted here during the primary in 2016, and then he went down to New Jersey and voted again in the 2016 primary. There she goes again. That's very, very, very disturbing. Just so and I've true. been all along, I've been saying that that is just wrong. That's what the Democrats do. We don't do that. We are the party, we are the party yeah. of election integrity. Yes. Photo ID, you have to show a photo ID. There has to be a paper trail. There has to be a paper ballot so that if there is a question, whether it's with the computer, whether it's with the tallying, that people can go back and they have a record of what happened and how people voted. So I do feel confident in the New Hampshire law. I know we have hundreds of people across the state who will be watching very closely. Mr. Mowers, you were invoked. You have 30 seconds. Well, I appreciate it because I think folks here deserve to know the truth, not the left wing spin. And this is something that was concocted six months ago by Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton, and Chris Pappas. The attorney general, as Adam, you reported, came out and said that there was nothing here. In fact, former U.S. attorney Tom Colantunio for New Hampshire said that anyone still talking about this is just playing politics. And so what we're hearing right now is more politics. I'm the only one who is in Trump Tower on election night with President Trump in 2016 when we actually were fighting for election integrity. I take it very seriously to make sure everyone has confidence in their elections. And that's what I'll continue to do. Councillor Prescott, do you, do you have confidence in next week's election? I certainly do. I, you know, as a senator, I was the prime sponsor of voter ID. I passed that legislation over the uh, veto of uh, Governor Lynch, who decided that after it was, it was put through the second time to just let it pass into law, because I worked with Governor Lynch, I worked with the town clerks in our state, and I made sure that on the day that we switched from not having voter ID checked to the day that they were checked, all votes were counted that day, and it went seamlessly because I was inclusive of all the people in New Hampshire from all sides. That experience comes because 24 years running for office, 14 years in office, that experience is priceless to getting the job done in Washington, D.C. I want to take that experience of fighting for our elections to Washington. Also, I would like to say that we need a person that has the integrity to tell the voters what they believe all the time. And I have filled out every single questionnaire 
and done that for the people of New Hampshire to make their own decision about who the candidate is best for running in November. Representative Baxter, to you on this. What's the specific question again? Do you have confidence in the Secretary of State and the hundreds it, of it. citizen volunteers who will run the election next week? Well, instead of just talking about election integrity, I led the fight here in New Hampshire, in the New Hampshire legislature, for a full forensic audit of the 2020 presidential election. Every single voter deserves nothing less than full transparency with our election results. And we audit businesses, we audit agencies of government. Of course, we should audit our elections. And my bill was free for taxpayers. This was just common sense. And people have so many concerns about the elections. There are people that won't vote because they don't believe their vote will count. And that is a shame. And you want to know why I stood up and introduced that bill? Because there was no one else that would do it. Leadership is doing what's right, not just what's popular or what's easy. And you can say the same thing when it comes to Matt Maurer's voting. Maybe it wasn't illegal. But it wasn't right. It was wrong. Now you were involved. 15 seconds quickly. Yeah, just really quickly. You know, this reminds me a lot of those debates in 2016 that happened here when President Trump came under attack all the time from liberals in his own party as well as liberals from the other party because they knew he was going to take on Washington, D.C. It's the exact same thing that's happening. It's why Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi weighed in on this attack against me and couldn't be further from the truth. And finally, I miss Levitt to you on this. Do you have confidence in next week's election? Well, you've cited the UNH poll. I don't believe in polls. I believe in people. And I consistently continue to be the only candidate in this race who says that I believe the 2020 election was undoubtedly stolen from President Trump. I do not believe that Joe Biden received 81 million votes. That's a preposterous claim. And after Matt Mowers voted twice, he said that he believes Joe Biden legitimately won more votes than Donald Trump. And I reject that. And I know voters across the state whom I've spoken with across the state over the last year reject that as well. I was working in the West Wing of the White House on election night 2020. We saw unelected bureaucrats across this country circumvent, circumvent state legislatures. They pushed absentee and mass ballots across the nation, leading to chaos and confusion. I saw the media's election interference for firsthand working in President Trump's White House. They censored and silenced negative stories about Joe Biden, most infamously the Hunter Biden laptop story, in an effort to get President Trump out of the White House. We need election integrity efforts here in our state, not down in Washington, D.C., like Chris Pappas and the Democrats seek to promote. You were invoked quickly again, Matt Mowers. You believe Biden won in 2020? Uh, just really briefly, I'm the only one here who actually worked with President Trump in 2016 to ensure we had election integrity around the country. I'm the only one who made sure that folks could put their ballot in and know it counted. And that's what we need to get back to. That's what's going to ensure integrity in our election process. That's what's going to ensure confidence in our Democratic Republic. Okay, now, let's... I'd like a chance to respond. Since he's referred to me several times as being a liberal, clearly referring to me, because all your hit pieces against me, you call me a liberal. I've been called a lot of things. I've been called old, fat, ugly. I've been called old grandma, but never liberal. I am not a liberal. I am not a liberal, so I just want to set the record straight. Thank you, Gail. Let's have a lightning round to shake things out a little bit here. Starting, we're going to move this way uh, through the uh, the studio here. Starting with you, Representative Baxter. Uh, this is just a simple yes or no question. You can add a qualifier if uh, it calls for it. Would you vote to impeach President Biden for anything he's done so far in office? Absolutely. Carol. Yes, the dereliction of duty at our southern border. He's allowed for an invasion of our country. He has betrayed his oath to the Constitution and our homeland. Ms. Huff Brown. The commander-in-chief has one job, to protect Americans at home and abroad, and he did not protect Americans in Afghanistan. That was the day I got into the race. All right, that's three for three. Councilor Prescott? Yes, I would. Four for four, and Matt Mowers. We do have to have hearings to look into these things. The fact that you had the president and secretary of defense lying to the American people about intelligence reports coming out of Afghanistan has to be looked into. Okay, uh, moving this way across the studio, starting with you, Mr. Mowers. Who did you support for president in the 2016 New Hampshire Republican primary? I was uh, working with Governor Christie at that time, and then he dropped out a day later, and we endorsed President Trump and went to work for him. Council Prescott. Jeb Bush. Ms. Huff Brown. Donald Trump. President Trump. In fact, I was one of the few students on this campus to raise my hand in support of him in the primary. All right. Representative Baxter. Rand Paul, and proud to have his endorsement. All right. Uh, again, moving this way, starting with you, Representative Baxter. The CDC just signed off on an updated COVID-19 booster shot. Do you plan on getting one? Yes or <laughs> it's no? It's none of your damn business. <laughs> Uh, Again, it's none of your business. I believe in medical freedom, personal responsibility, but in the effort of transparency, absolutely not. Right. 
Ms. Huff Brown? I don't support mandates for vaccines or for masks, and uh, I will not be getting any boosters. All right. Council Prescott? I do plan on getting a booster. I plan on being able to, um, you know, travel the, the country freely, but it shouldn't be mandated that I have to have a booster. So that is one reason I would be against boosters, but if it was a mandate for travel. Mr. Mowers. I can say, because I'm tired of stigmatizing people who choose to get boosted or not. I mean, how about those heroes of ours, the soldiers, the police officers who were fired because they chose not to get the shot before? Now, look, it's up to every individual, and I, I support science. So if you believe you want to choose to get a booster, great, go for it. But it should be stigmatizing and then firing people over it. Those heroes should be rehired. I've called for it publicly. It's about time that gets done. All right, last lightning round question, starting with Mr. Mowers and moving right to left. Uh, what was the last job you held that was not in politics or media? It's my colonel. I've got a small business right now. Uh, that I work with a lot of different startups around both the region and the country. All right. Council Prescott. It's the same job I've had for 38 years, RE Prescott Company, where we manufacture water treatment equipment. I have seven U.S. patents, and we manufacture our equipment there. Ms. Huff Brown. I am a licensed realtor with Carrie and Giampa, located in Rye, Portsmouth, Seacoast. Ms. Levitt? I currently work at my family's small business in Plastow, New Hampshire. I'm proud to be raised in a small business family here in our state. And I'd like to address this because Matt Mowers recently put out a hit piece against me saying I've never held a job outside the D.C. swamp. My family owns two businesses in this district. That's a lie. You might not think scooping ice cream and selling cars and trucks is a real job, but it absolutely is. And I'm proud to be from a small business family in this state and be supported by so many small business owners and workers in our community. Representative Baxter. I run my own small business. It's a real estate business. I restore and renovate properties throughout New Hampshire. All right, let's jump back into the policy questions with Gene Mackin. All right, thanks, Adam. Many on the stage tonight have been outspoken about illegal immigration and drugs coming across the southern border. But how far should the U.S. go to stop that flow of drugs? Should the U.S. military actually cross the border to further U.S. interests? And what would that look like? We will begin with you, Councillor Prescott. To go over the border, if we have strong ties with Mexico, to work with them to root out the problem, I'd be in, I would be in favor of that. But just to say that we're going to go over and be, uh, you know, directing military aid down there without having a full detailed plan, I would never be in, 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 uh, want to be involved with that. Mr. Mowers. You know, I'm the only one here who worked with President Trump to both disrupt the flow of Chinese fentanyl coming into the United States, as well as to secure the border to stop it from coming across the border. Fentanyl right now is the number one killer of those 18 to 45. Fentanyl. There's over 100,000 deaths every single year of Americans because of fentanyl. We should be declaring the drug cartels as terror organizations. We gotta have folks who have the backbone and willingness to say that, because if any other organization were to kill over 100,000 Americans every single year, that's exactly what we'd call them. You know, I don't talk about this much, but my mom suffers from addiction. Has for a long time with both drugs, with um, both painkillers and alcohol. I know the pain and suffering that so many go through when they see loved ones who suffer from addiction. I can only imagine if it somehow wasn't just alcohol and painkillers, but was fentanyl. There is no coming back from that. We do it to our neighbors and the lives that have lost to get serious and tough. That means declaring them as terrorist organizations, hunting them down, and disrupting these illicit networks. I've done it before, and I will do it again to protect New Hampshire. To you, Ms. Brown. So I am the only one here who's actually been to the border. And Matt, I am sorry to hear about your family's addiction issue. Um, I really am. Addiction is a, is a terrible, terrible thing. But you've had four years to go down to the border and find out what's happening there. I did go down to the border, so concerned about the fentanyl coming up here and killing our young people. Like probably everyone here, I've lost friends to fentanyl overdoses. Went down to the border, I got the, the patrol council's uh, endorsement and they have not endorsed very many people. I got the endorsement from Sean Hannity because he knows that I will work to get on Homeland Security and do everything I can to close the border. We are not a nation without borders. We are not a nation. We have to finish the wall. We have to close the asylum loophole. It allows people to come into this country and stay here indefinitely. We never find them again. They're lost. We can't allow that to happen anymore. We have to close the border. 
All right, uh, to you, Ms. Levitt. Well, let's be very clear about what is going on in our country right now. The Democrats, Joe Biden, Chris Pappas included, are allowing for an illegal invasion of our country, both with illegal aliens, more illegal aliens have poured into our country than there are citizens of our great state of New Hampshire over the past two years. And we have seen an unprecedented amount of fentanyl pouring into our communities. It's hurting our law enforcement community and it's hurting my generation of Granite Staters. I have former friends, colleagues, teammates who are no longer with us because they stuck a needle in their arms with drugs that came up from our southern border. We have to build the wall that President Trump fought so hard to accomplish. We've already paid for some of it. There's resources rotting away at the southern border right now that this administration is not utilizing for political gain. We need to return to the Remain in Mexico policy that was very effective, and we need to re-implement the effective migrant deterrent policies that are allowing these drug traffickers to invade our country. And I will always vote against amnesty when I am elected to Congress. We need to be a nation of law and order and strong borders and this must be a day one priority of this new Congress. And your thoughts, Representative Baxter? Well, the fentanyl, the heroin is coming over the southern border. It's destroying our communities here in New Hampshire. And that's why I started a small nonprofit, Second Chances, to help people struggling with addiction get into treatment programs. And I've been proud to help 12 people uh, get a second chance. It's been one of the most humbling things in my life. And we have to get tough on immigration, on illegals. Here in New Hampshire, I led the fight in the legislature to stop illegal aliens. We should bus them out of this state. We should bus them to Joe Biden's uh, mansion in, in Delaware and the White House in D.C. But I led the fight to mandate E-Verify to get illegals out of New Hampshire. This is vital. We have to secure the border, build the wall, and never have amnesty in any way, shape, or fashion in this country. And just like I led the effort here in New Hampshire, I'll be committed to leading the fight in D.C. to stop illegals. All right, next question coming from me. In a recent NBC News poll by both a Democratic and Republican pollster, a record 58% of respondents said that America's best days are behind it and that, quote, threats to democracy is now the top issue facing the country overtaking the cost of living. Do you think people with opposing political beliefs are too far apart to work together anymore? And is that worrisome to you? We're starting with you, Councillor Prescott. It's not worrisome to me that uh, the future is bright. I know it's bright. What worries him to me is negative campaigning, not having an open communication, even amongst our own people in our own party. That is a problem. Ever since I lost to Maggie Hassan in 2004 from running negative campaigns, I decided to myself, Russell, don't be a hypocrite. Practice what you've taught your children to do, to be kind to others. And because of that, when I won again in 2010, against Maggie Hassan. It was a positive campaign. And that was the best 10 years after that of my entire time in the State Senate and the Executive Council to bring real meaningful growth to New Hampshire's economy, to concentrate on the issues, tell people what I'm going to do, fill out every questionnaire, make sure they know where I stand. And I received the Republican vote and the Democrat vote, I mean, sorry, and the independent vote, that's what's needed to win in November. That's time, Councillor. Ms. Levitt. Well, the division is being caused and wreaked by this commander in chief, Joe Biden. His speech last week was arguably the most divisive and d disgusting speech that any president, certainly in my lifetime, has ever given. He essentially waged war on half of the country by saying that we are all a threat to democracy because we believe in putting America first. It's not radical to want to put your country and your own people first. It's not radical to want to have a strong border, a strong military, and to unleash the might of your own economy, not economies around the world. You know, we have seen cultural Marxism trickling its way through every institution in this country. The public school system, the higher education university system, Hollywood, big tech, the corrupt mainstream media that I fought against in President Trump's White House are indoctrinating my generation of Americans into hating our country, hating one another based on race and gender and sex and all of this other BS, quite frankly. We need a congresswoman who is going to fight for our conservative American values, love of God, love of country, love of freedom. Ms. Huff Brown. Well, I would like to say that I am an independent conservative. 
I'm not beholden to anyone in Washington, D.C., and I'm very, very hopeful. I want to go to Washington, D.C., and I want to fight against Biden and his administration. Lower inflation, close the border, stop the spending, pass a parental bill of rights. Those are just some of the things that I want to do. But I remain very, very hopeful about this country. Listen, the reason I wanted to get into this race is because of my grandchildren. I look at them and I say, what kind of America are they going to grow up in? Are they going to be able to hang a flag? Are they going to be able to say God in public? What kind of America will they have? Will they have the opportunities that my husband and I have had? That worries me. So I'm very, very serious about going to Washington and being a, an independent conservative, somebody that's not beholden to anyone. I'm not beholden to leadership, Kevin McCarthy, like Matt Mowers or Elise Stefanik. I am not beholden to anyone. I'm an independent conservative. Mr. Mowers. Well, I can't blame folks for having lack of trust in D.C. because we've seen both Republicans and Democrats get hauled away for corruption. We've seen Republicans and Democrats do nothing to address the problems time and time again. What we need to do is actually finally get serious about restoring the trust in Washington, D.C. That's why I've been so vocal about calling for a ban on stock trading by members of Congress and their families. No more making $5 million off of a stock transaction the way that Nancy and Paul Pelosi have, when at the same time, they're not regulating the industry that they got rich off of. That's also why I'm a big supporter of term limits. The other thing we have to do is just stop this division that's being forced down our children's throats in school, this woke indoctrination curriculum, telling people that they have to be divided by the haves and the have-nots, telling them that they have to be divided by race or by gender. You know, when my one-year-old goes to school, I want him to be taught nothing more than the immortal words of Martin Luther King, which is judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And that's what we need to build our society back on. And that's what's going to unite us as Americans again. Representative Baxter. Well, people are so negative right now, the voters, because of how corrupt our political process is. Mowers, his buddy, swamp rat Kevin McCarthy, is spending $2 million to try to get him over the finish line. And Caroline Levitt, she's endorsed Kevin McCarthy for speaker too. She then lied about it, got caught, tried to cover it up, and now won't answer the question who she's going to vote for for speaker for her very first vote. And why this matters is when the first controversial vote happens, the freshman reps, they're going to be rounded up by the leadership. They're going to whip them and tell them, this is how you have to vote. If you vote the wrong way, you get thrown off a committee. If you vote the wrong way, we won't fund your reelection campaign. This is what's wrong. That's why I've pledged to be against Kevin McCarthy for speaker, because we don't need another corrupt swamp rat like Paul Ryan stabbing the America First agenda in the back. We don't need a pawn of the swamp as our representative in D.C. We need a real conservative fighter, and I'm the only proven conservative fighter on this stage. We've had a hard wall for our closing statements. We're going to begin 45 seconds each. Ms. Huff-Brown, starting with you. Well, thank you very much to all of our viewers out there that have watched this debate tonight. This is important. You're picking somebody that you want to send to Washington, somebody that represents you, somebody who understands the walk that you've taken, has put their kids through school, has helped their elderly through their passing days, has a mother on Social Security, has purchased a home, knows how to pay a mortgage, has lived these things. I would argue that I have life experience and three years, more than three years overseas, 30 years as a reporter, asking questions, investigating, researching, and I would love and be humbled to get your vote. Mr. Prescott, Councilor Prescott, Thank to you. Thank you very much. I've been a husband for, 20, for 40 years. I've been in business for 38 years, balancing budgets, raising, raising a family, five children, and seven grandchildren. I have real life experience, and I think I've shown that to you tonight. I brought that experience to Concord, and we, by being a very conservative person, making sure our economy grew, I was also a positive campaigner in making sure that my views were known by everyone. Please go to russellprescott.com. You know where I stand. You know my record. You can see how I've behaved in this campaign. I'm very proud of that campaign. And I'm proud to be a great a grandfather, a father, and a husband. And I'm trying to make them proud. And I will make New Hampshire proud as your congressman. Representative Baxter, your closing statement. The people need to know that the game is rigged against you. Kevin McCarthy, the corrupt swamp rat, 
is spending $2 million to boost his puppet, Mowers. Kevin McCarthy endorsed Mowers, but Caroline Levitt endorsed Kevin McCarthy as well. They're two sides of the same corrupt coin. But you have another choice. Send me the Washington, a real conservative fighter. I have a 100% with HRA, New Hampshire's constitutional group. I'm endorsed by Rand Paul. I'm a small business owner, a nonprofit founder, a state rep. Give me a call at 603-997-8108. Mr. Mauer, your closing statement? Well, thank you very much. You know, um, my grandfather, Pop Pop Jack, was able to get a pass from going into World War II if he wanted to because he was working on the family farm. He chose not to. He chose to go fight and defend American values over in the European theater. My wife and I welcomed our one-year-old in our arms just about a year ago. Uh, we couldn't think of a more fitting tribute that didn't also name him Jack after my grandfather. I think about the sacrifices that so many have made to make our country great. I think about what's been given by so many to ensure that we have this freedom. I want to ensure that American dream can be passed on to my son, too. We need to get back to tested conservative leadership the way we had when I worked with President Trump to ensure we had the Keystone Pipeline so it could be energy independent, when we got tough on taking down the drug traffickers, and when we ensured that the bureaucracy was taken on and brought power back to the people. All right, Ms. Levitt, your closing statement. Well, thank you so much to everyone who is tuning in tonight. In January of 2023, we are going to have an illegal invasion on our southern border continue. We are still going to have rising inflation that's stealing thousands of dollars from us every single day. And we are going to need a congresswoman who will put America in New Hampshire first again. I've already done that in President Trump's White House, fighting against the corrupt establishment and the corrupt media. I'm the only candidate on this stage that Kevin McCarthy and the establishment are spending $4 million in vicious attack ads against to help Matt Mowers because he is bought and paid for. They know I'm the greatest threat on this stage to the establishment. They know I'm from New Hampshire. I will always be for New Hampshire. And I humbly ask for your vote next Tuesday on the 13th of September. All right, that wraps things up in the first Congressional District Republican debate. The election is one week from tonight, and WMUR, of course, has all the resources you need to be prepared. You'll find this full debate posted on our digital platforms, as well as more information about the candidates and where they stand on the issues. You'll also find links with information about voter registration and where to find your polling place. And, of course, join us back here tomorrow night at 8 to hear from the candidates in the second Congressional District. We'll hear from U.S. Senate candidates on Thursday and Republican candidates for governor on Friday. Thank you to the candidates. Thank you to our panelists. And I thank you, of course, all of you at home for joining us. Have a great night.